It's such a crystal clear day that Washington could have seen across the Delaware with no problem at all. The Mets are in our nation's capital looking for a series victory as plenty of Mets fans have found their way to the Washington area to watch the flowering Mets in bloom in 2006. From RFK Stadium in Washington, WB11 Sports presents New York Mets baseball. Today, the Mets play the Washington Nationals. And a pleasant good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Washington. Gary Cohen and Ron Darling with you today as the Mets go for the rubber game of the three-game series. Mets won 6-4 to four last night over the Nationals, and today they trot out the winningest pitcher in baseball over the last two months. Yeah, 9-1, and 11-5 and five is his record so far this year, and if you look at his stats, you wouldn't think that he could possibly have this many wins, but he's gotten a lot of base runners. He's gotten the outs when he's needed them. The Mets' Felix, Felix Unger is Steve Traxel. The Sidious. He's a perfectionist and so far doing well on the season going against Tony Armas who's seven and eight this year Armas who was seven and seven last year a 500 pitcher who usually goes five or six innings looking at our Budweiser pitching matchup Armas has spent his requisite month on the disabled list this year but he's always pitched well against the Mets he has and he throws a fastball and a slider he's the son of the famous slugger from the Red Sox A's and other people Tony Armas senior so it'll be a, a good matchup between two pitchers today who really work very slowly, especially when people get on base. So it's one of those games where put the crock pot on at the end of the game, <laughs> dinner will be ready. <laughs> so it's our Traxel against Armas this afternoon. The Mets and the Nationals. Rubber game of three here in our nation's capital. And we'll come back and get you ready for the first pitch of today's game in just a moment. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Lexus and their passionate pursuit of perfection. By Verizon Online DSL, now at a great low price. By Dodge, you can take life as it comes or you can grab life by the horns. Dodge. By Budweiser. Bright, clean, crisp, pure. This is Budweiser. This is beer. And by Infinity, using the power of design to create dynamic, beautiful automobiles. Fans coming into RFK Stadium were better than 42,000 paid last night and a big crowd on hand today. Last night, Met fans were out cheering Nationals fans at some point. And 28 year old Tony Armas takes the mound for the Nationals this afternoon. And here's the Mets lineup brought to you by Nissan and your local Nissan dealers. Carlos Beltran, two more extra base hits last night as he closes on on Howard Johnson's club record of 80 extra base hits. A start for Mike DeFelice, day game after a night game. Ricky Lede in left field, and Andy Chavez gets his way back into the lineup. Well, Tony Armas Jr., fastball slider pitcher, throws his fastball around 90. Good slider. Started out the season very strong, but since June 4th, is 1 and 5 with an 8.17 ERA and averages almost 18 pitches per inning. The defense for the Nationals presented by Washington Mutual Soriano of course with those 19 assists in left field Ryan Church gets to start in center field he's been in triple A for most of the season and Brian Schneider again behind the plate day game after a night game. And there is Alfonso Soriano who has commanded so much attention all the way back from spring training and. As we said on Friday night, he, he really had one bad day when he refused to go to the outfield, and since then everything has shined for Soriano. And Jose Reyes takes ball one. Reyes riding an eight-game hitting streak as the average of 297 for the year. And Omas, who often will work from behind in the count, is behind 2-0 and on Reyes. Andy Chavez hitting second Carlos Beltran behind him and when the Mets have this batting order they've got so much speed at the top of their lineup. And Reyes punches one foul two and two in the last couple of days with Michael Tucker getting the start three consecutive starts and the day coming over I'm sure Andy Chavez was hey Willie don't forget about me remember I've been doing really well all year but of course uh, trying to see if Tucker can play still and the day of course for the start today. That's very much trying to figure out their corner outfield situation as Reyes pops it up left side of the infield battling the Sun Zimmerman and that's the first down of the game 
And the sun certainly will be a factor, particularly on the left side today. So one out of nobody on. Here's Chavez. And you go back to the 28th of June. Indy has made 15 starts in that span, so that's about seven weeks. And in that span, in those starts, he's hitting 418. That's how good he's been. And at the same time, if you're Willie Randolph, you're reluctant to run him out there every day. Gives you so many options when he's on the bench. You have a guy that can be a late inning great defensive replacement in the outfield. A guy that if you need to lead off if you're behind in the game can do that as a pinch hitter. One and one to Chavez. There you see the numbers. There's a strike one and two. And you wonder right now if the Mets were starting the postseason and say Cliff Floyd were healthy who would be their starting right fielder game one of the playoffs. Well right now it depends if there's a right hander. Well this is what I would do if it was a right hander I would have Millage or Chavez. You, you would think that you know against a lefty maybe Millage against a righty Chavez. Yeah I think that's what I would go with those are the especially Chavez proving that they're the best players. Picked up by Marlon Anderson and he throws out Chavez two away. So Andy hit it hard. Two out and nobody on. Well, nice play, kind of a short hop by Marlon Anderson. You can only make that play if you have nice soft hands. That's the key to that play. Good play by Anderson. So two out and nobody on. Here's Beltron. Carlos with a single, double, and triple last night. Came up his last time up with a chance for the cycle, but said he didn't realize that he had a chance for the cycle. He thought he had two doubles rather than a double and a triple. And how he forgot it was his first triple of the year. One and one to Carlos. But if you're a teammate, you kind of like that, don't you? Because he's not up there even thinking he's going for the cycle, which tells you that he's not concerned with triples or doubles or whatever he's doing. Just get on base. He's got 64 extra base hits now, 98 runs batted in. That's fourth in the league. And Armas throws a fastball by him, one and two. Well, Armas will at times trying to go inside with that fastball, but he has a lot of movement. Schneider sitting inside, and he'll throw a lot of those fastballs upstairs that'll run away from the left-handed hitters. And slider misses. Well. Armas got off to a good start with the Nationals this year, but for his last eight starts, his ERA is over eight. So he's trying to get himself reestablished. Three and two to Beltron, but you know, Armas has thrown 103 innings this year. That's the most innings he's thrown in any season in four years. To give you an idea just how often he's been hurt. Beltron fouls off. And as a manager of a team, if one of your five pitchers or top four that's what he is is only making that many starts a year it just throws your entire rotation your uh, bullpen into disarray because the guy is going to make five or seven starts he's going to be out for three starts come back it really makes it difficult to have any cohesive kind of pitching unit Beltron fouls off another one and now with Levon Hernandez traded away and John Patterson out for the year and Zach Day on the disabled list and all the injuries that the Nationals have had they need more than ever for Armas to be a reliable guy to go out there every five days. You need him Jason Bergman they are trying to experiment with him becoming a starter after using him as a reliever last year. Long at bat for Beltron. Jim Bowden even went to John Roush who's been the great bridge man to Cordero and asked him would he like to start. So it's a. Uh, they don't have that many bodies and they're just trying to get enough people to put in the rotation. Ninth pitch of the at bat and Beltran leases one to center. Ryan Church back and he's there. And he can't hit it much harder but Beltran lines out. And so it's a one two three inning for Tony Armas and Traxel takes the mound for New York. Steve Traxel bids for his 12th win of the year today. As it takes on this Nationals lineup brought to you by Nissan and your Nissan dealers Alfonso Soriano 
It is 20th home run in this ballpark last night. Only one other player has ever done that. And he was known as the Capital Bomber. <laughs> Frank Howard. Well, Steve Traxel on the mound for the Mets today in this getaway day. Traxel, 10 games over 500 at night, but 20 under during the day games. They seem to be his Achilles heel. And the Washington Mutual Mets defense, Ricky Lede in left field. In his first start for the Mets, Willie Randolph had him in right field, but Chavez is there today. And Mike DeFelice getting his third start for the Mets, catching Traxel today. And Lede checking out the sun in left field, which will certainly be a factor all day. Nice to see him with the sunglasses on. Often we've seen sunglasses on top of hats which doesn't do a whole lot of good. Soriano takes ball one. Well, Jose Reyes what happened to him once this year and then yesterday's ball game matter of fact there he's going on cue. Look at that. <laughs> he got <laughs> away Jose. <laughs> and Soriano lifts one down the right field line that'll curl toward the stands. One and one to Soriano. Soriano hit his 37th of the year last night. Off John Main. Second in the National League in home runs behind Ryan Howard. 28 stolen bases, so he's on his way to his fourth 30 30 year. And right up on top of the plate. It's got to be pretty attractive for Frank Robinson to watch Soriano hit because Frank Robinson. Was the same kind of hitter, stood right on the plate, dared you to come inside, and he would just spin and hit all those home runs that he hit. Not only close to the plate, but something you don't see a lot of these days up near the front of the batter's box. If you look at the uh, the only two who have ever hit 20 home runs in this ballpark in a season, Frank Howard. Could have hit about of Yellowstone, as they said the day. Never see that front foot at the front edge of that box. And Traxel gets him with the splitter for the first out. We see spread out, and one of the reasons he stands so far up in that box is that he does not like that break pitch in the dirt. So getting up in the box, sometimes he can catch it before it goes in the dirt. Not that time, though. So one out and nobody on here's Felipe Lopez who's had a good series three for eight in the first two games came over from the Cincinnati Reds in that deal before the all star break and he takes the curveball for a strike and Traxel gets ahead of him 0 and 2. A lot of back and forth over the last few days between the front offices in Washington and Cincinnati about that trade and the condition of Gary Majeski and what the Reds knew and what they didn't know and what they asked for and what they didn't ask for. Also known as shoulder gate around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been a lot of covering one's posterior. And a strikeout for Traxel, back to back strikeouts and for Traxel, who's been striking out very few, he gets a left hand hitter for the first time in ages. And it's hard to believe that has happened because he is a split finger pitcher. He's got a great one. That's what he threw right there. And Lopez swinging, not even close on that split finger. In his five starts since the All Star break, as you look at Jim Bowden, the Washington general manager, who Wayne Krivsky was upset with for sending him damaged goods and Gary Majeski. Five starts since the All Star break. Traxel faced 50 left hand batters, didn't strike out a single one. But he just struck out Lopez, two down. Zimmerman hits one well to right. Chavez back has room, and that retires the side. So Traxel, with a couple of punch outs, has himself a 1 2 3 inning. Let's come up in the second against Armas with no score.
Be sure to be at Shea Friday at 7, 10 p.m. when the Mets host the Rockies for the start of a weekend series, including the big Saturday night reunion of members of the 86 championship team. Then the St. Louis Cardinals come to New York next Tuesday for a three-game set. Go to Mets.com now for your prorated season tickets. Second inning, Carlos Delgado leads off against Tony Armas, and the Nationals go into full shift against Carlos. He's 0 for 5 in this series and has really been struggling again. Gets the first pitch in the air to right, and Austin Kearns right there waiting. One pitch, one out. We saw flashes for about 10 days from Delgado that he was in some sort of a groove but he's been unable to sustain that. I wonder if you know when you're a home run hitter and you go through a period of time where most of your even your outs are not hard outs or are not long distance outs that you start to doubt yourself and it, and it builds on itself and you start to try to pull it and hit it further more and more every at bat. He was so hot during June when the Mets went on that nine and one road trip and struggled for about a month after that He's back in that that difficult period again and as we talked about last night having Beltron and Wright having such big years on either side of them has cushioned the blow of Delgado struggling the way he has Wright just one for seven in this series at a double last night and Armas gets ahead of him 0 and two. Well, you know, when you think about it, the Rick Down is the hitting coach for the Mets, but really, Carlos Delgado is his own hitting coach. I mean, he's been to three organizations. And, and Armas gets right on three pitches, and Armas has set down the first five to face him. Well, this is a good slider. As David Wright out in front, good place to down and away off the strike zone. A pitch you don't usually see David chase that far out of the zone. It's a pitch that when he's struggling he will chase it which he doesn't struggle very often because that's a pitch he likes that ball out over the plate so you can almost tease him with it and you have a good slider that was a tight one tight slider by Armas. We'll say Valentin takes a strike Valentin had the go ahead hit last night a tremendous at bat against a rookie Chris Schroeder in the seventh inning found off numerous pitches and then dumped a single into right to get the go ahead run home. And that's the kind of year Valentin has had. Hit to left. And Soriano right there. And angles his body to keep the sun away. And almost making it look easy early. He's retired the first six. Well, you may have heard that this September the WB 11 is changing into the CW 11, and some of you have asked if that means no more Mets here on Channel 11. Well, not to worry. The name of the station may be changing, but the CW 11 will still be the place to cheer on the Mets for years to come. Nick Johnson leads off the home second inning. After Traxel worked to one, two, three first. And Johnson takes a strike. Nick Johnson who broke up John Maine's shutout string last night after 26 consecutive scoreless innings and he broke it up emphatically <laughs> a long home run he's never been known as a power hitter but he's got his 18 home runs this year he's not uh, unless he gets in a spot where he knows he's going to get a fastball he will try to jump you occasionally. is an alley hitter what he's trying to do if you're going to pitch him away he's going to try to drive the ball to left center if you pitch him in he's going to drive it to right center. Austin Kearns hitting fifth in the order on deck. Now Nick Johnson's having a terrific year and most importantly he's stayed healthy all year. Up among the league leaders and on base percentage as he generally is has 35 doubles. Splitter misses two and two. Talk about a hitter who knows how to get into an at bat, get into a count, where he gets a pitch that he can handle. That is Nick Johnson. On 
two and two Traxel strikes him out. So he's fanned two left hand hitters in this game after going five starts without fanning any. And he's got his third strikeout. Well I like this combination of pitches from Traxel. He usually doesn't spend a lot of time pitching upstairs in the strike zone. But it would be a great combination for him because he can throw a curveball off of that pitch. He can throw a split finger in the dirt off that pitch. So one out in the home second and here's Austin Kearns. Kearns in 25 games with the Nationals has hit just one home run. And you know one of the reasons why Washington brought him over from Cincinnati was because here's a guy who could add a little sock to the middle of their order. It's ballpark in Cincinnati though. That's the only problem. Unless you're Soriano. <laughs> yeah. Kearns loses his bat for the second straight night. This one didn't quite make it to the stands the way it did last night. That it went to the camera well. But that's the, the same thing that happened to Kearns in last night's game. Well, he's got to get some different pine tar, Austin Kearns, as again, the hammer throw with the bat. Watch out there. The cameraman, or one of the cameramen. Guys now use that, that spray. Instead of the, the pine tar rag. Pine tar rag, and then uh, Manny Moda has that stickum that you can rub on the uh, on the bat, and that's was really popular for a long time. But you're right. Now they have that spray that they'll spray not only in their gloves, but they'll spray on the bat. Two and one to Currents. There's the rag. I think it's nasty by the end of the year. I'll tell you. Two and two to Kearns is trying to make good use of that fastball. Well, this was last night. There goes the helicopter. And this one actually struck a kid on the arm. Not anything particularly severe. It's hard to get out of the way of a spinning bat. Three and two to Kearns. Todd Pratt during his days with events was the king. Of losing the bat. Yeah, he throws some helicopters all over the place. He did it three times in one game in Atlanta. The old ballpark. Popped up. Right battling the sun. Reyes over with a better angle. And that's a good job by Reyes as Wright was looking straight up into the sun. So two out and nobody on. Let's check in with Chris Cotter. Chris. Hey Gary and Rod. You know Steve Trax was off to a good start tonight. He's hoping that his trip to Washington ends a little bit better than it began. Uh, as we know, he is a wine connoisseur, so much so that when we go out on the road, the ripple that they serve, you know, the Night Train Express and the Mad Dog just will not do. He's got to bring his own wine. So he brings a case, usually three or four bottles of different varietals with him. Well, on Thursday after the game at Shea Stadium, he went through security uh, there at Shea to get on the bus to go to the airport, and they told him no liquids because of the terrorist plot that was foiled in London. So he had to pack the wine along with the rest of the luggage, so very disconcerting for Steve but lucky for him the luggage and the wine made it without a spill and he's been able to savor the, the uh, different varietals here in Washington hopefully he can savor a victory today and another bat goes flying out of the hands of Ryan Church what is going on get the pine tar recharged fans avoid batted balls and <laughs> bats we have to add that well, something about Traxel is uh, causing bats to fly all over the ballpark. Well Ryan Church is a great fastball hitter so the result is, is he sees a steady diet of breaking pitches and change ups. How about Chris Cotter dropping a varietals on us. <laughs> that was very nice. That's a man who drinks wine himself at least. <laughs> Obviously he's staying away from the ripple. So no Boone's farm for the onophile <laughs> Traxel. No. That's all I know about wine. It's, uh, I don't know whether it's oaky or has a buttery finish or hints of tannins. I know nothing about that stuff. You just you just expanded my knowledge well beyond where it was. Red and white. Tannin. <laughs> you a cornerback for the Jets, wasn't it? That's right. I never could understand that. It's a grape. It's not. There are no hints of raspberry. It's a grape. Ryan Church takes it high. Church getting the start in center field after Alex Escobar played the first two games of the series. Well, that's been a revolving door center field for the Nationals this year. 
Marlon and Anderson on deck. And right at Valentin. And so Steve Traxel, like Tony Amos, perfect through the first two innings. So a couple of slow moving pitchers off to a fast start. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Dunkin Donuts America runs on Dunkin. Third inning neither teams had a base runner. As Ricky Lede leads off against Tony Armas. Lede making his second start as a Met. He's had just 59 at bats overall this year. He was on the disabled list for two and a half months while he was with the Dodgers because of a groin injury. So. The day's season has barely started. And he takes a strike. Ricky's 32 years old now. And the Mets are hoping that he can give them a little left handed pop off the bench. Between Armas and Traxel. Traxel works slowly with men on base. Armas works slowly all the time. And the changeup misses three and one. Brian Schneider told me that he will put down a pitch, Armas will shake it off, and he'll give all the other signs, and he'll go back to the original pitch and he'll say, Yeah. Like, like he forgot that he'd already given that sign. <laughs> It finally clicked in. <laughs> and you wonder about that. Is that because a pitcher's mind wanders? Because he's not focused on the task at hand? Well, I, I think with Tony Armas. Strikes out the day. That's his second strikeout. Well, good pitch there, up and in. That's a pitch that right handed pitchers, if you can throw that pitch consistently, you will tie up left handed hitters. That's upcoming schedule brought to you by ChevyOffers.com. The latest offers from Chevrolet. Four games in Philadelphia coming up. Great pitching matchup of veteran and highly touted rookie tomorrow night. Pedro Martinez against Cole Hamels at Citizens Bank Park. As Mike DeFelice takes ball one. DeFelice looking for his first hit. Making his third start today. The designated day game catcher now with Ramon Castro. On the disabled list. Ramon's down in Port St. Lucie trying to rehab his strained oblique and it's going pretty slowly. That's reunion down at Port St. Lucie. <laughs> <laughs> Meet you at the outback. Steve <laughs> <laughs> Police lifts one to left. Soriano flips the glasses. And there's just enough room in foul territory. Two out. You're talking about Armas and his concentration. Well, number one biggest problem with Tony Armas is you see Steve Traxel come to plate, staying healthy. So he's never out there enough to show what he can do. 35, 34, 35 starts. The other thing that I think he suffers from is that he's very proud, and sometimes proud can turn into stubborn. And when you're stubborn, I think you're not open to new ideas. And I think at this point in his career. He doesn't have 95 with a razor blade slider, so he has to develop where early in the game he can go with that fastball and slider, but he's got to go the second or third time through the lineup. He's got to have some kind of slower breaking pitch or a good changeup. It's ahead on tracks, a low and two. Looking magnificent the first time through the batting order. And from the people I've talked to, and even from talking to Tony himself, he's just, I've seen him where he gets really angry when things don't work out right for him on the mound whether it's a guy making an error or him not making a pitch and he gets frustrated but he's making his pitches now first time through the batting order he's gone perfectly still no base runners in this game as so we go to the bottom of the third This September the WB 11 is changing into the new CW 11. So what does this mean to fans of the WB 11 morning news and the news at 10? Well the name of the station may be changing but the CW 11 will still be the place to find the award winning news shows you count on. 
There are Met fans all over Washington, D.C. There's so many of them. In the Washington Post article on the game yesterday, it was centered around how many Met fans were here who were cheering for the Mets, and they should cheer for the Mets. That's how good they were last night. Well, the Met fans were loud enough that they were able to, to overwhelm the national fans late in the game. Better than 42,000 on hand last night, a similar crowd for the game today. And so far, it has been completely dominated by the two pitchers. Much as the Met fans have dominated the crowd. Marlon Anderson will lead off against Traxel in the bottom of the third. Marlon's been playing second base every day in the absence of Jose Vidro, who's out with a hamstring injury. The guy who has really battled injury problems the last few years. And it really makes you wonder about Alfonso Soriano and his future if indeed the Nationals do resign him. Will it be to play second base as Anderson bluffs the bottom? Yeah, because I, I, in my mind, I think because of all that wear and tear on the turf in Montreal, Jose Vidro's legs have betrayed him here later in his career. Vidro, usually a machine to hit 40 plus doubles, always hit 300, um, has not looked like that kind of player the last two years. Tracks will be high on the count 2 0. Marlon takes a strike. Marlon Anderson, a big part of the Mets bench last year, had a great year pinch hitting. Brian Schneider on deck. But went to the Nationals when they offered him a two year deal. The Mets offered him one. And now tries to behind the three and one. Funny thing about the Mets this year is they haven't had the need as they did last year as much for pinch hitters. Delgado makes the unassisted play on Anderson. I mean, Julio Franco's had a good year of pinch hitting, but this Mets team is so solid up and down the lineup that you don't use pinch hitters as much as was Willie had to last year. Well, the first five or six guys in the lineup, you're just not going to even go there. That's how good they are. Maybe at the bottom of the lineup for the pitcher occasionally, and also the Mets have won 70 games. They're 25 over 500. They are leading a lot of games at the end of the day, so no need to do that. Teams with the most pinch hits usually are the teams at the bottom of the standing. Absolutely. One out and nobody on. Here's Brian Schneider catching a day game after a night game. As uh, the backup, Brandon Harper, a career minor leaguer, and Frank Robinson running Schneider right back out there today. Two and out. Brandon Harper has played in 10 different minor league cities. Was even in the main paper, the Post today, rating those cities, his favorite minor league towns. Which uh, I'm happy I didn't have to do that. You know, you know when you've had a long minor league career, when you rate number one on your all-time <laughs> list of favorite cities, Toledo, <laughs> as Brandon Harper did today in that story. Curveball for a strike. First time I played in Toledo in the old stadium. Toledo had some great players, Frank Viola, Kirby Puckett. It was nickel beer night. Now to get to God. your locker room, you had to walk underneath the stands. Ned Skeldon Stadium. And they just, the fans just, we, the and Tidewater Tides won the game and they lost the war as we were drenched <laughs> with the nickel beer night. I guess Brandon Harper wasn't there that no. night. <laughs> <laughs> he missed that night in Toledo. Chris, he played in Toledo with the new ballpark with there, which I hear is just gorgeous. Three and one to Schneider, and he lashes one to short, but Reyes is there. And a stretch by Delgado saves Reyes an error, two out. Uh, Reyes a little offline with the throw, but Delgado stayed with it, two away. You know, a little offline with this throw. That was ball was hit very sharply by Schneider. But throughout the year, Reyes only with 10 errors. As Carlos Delgado goes to one knee to make that play, his arm has been as accurate as you could want the shortstops to be. No question. Power and accuracy. So here's Armas, who's never been much of a hitter. His dad was a great home run hitter with the A's and the Red Sox. Instead, his mom's jeans in that department. 
Tony Armas who does not like being called Tony Armas Jr. He and his dad have different middle names and he's always wanted to forge his own identity. out on the curveball and Traxel just like Armas perfect through the first three innings four strikeouts for Traxel and nary a base runner as we go to the fourth. Fourth inning Jose Reyes will lead off and Reyes had uh, a triple last night his 15th and that leads us to our Dodge trivia question before Jose Reyes who had 17 last year and now is 15 this year who was the last National League player to have at least 15 triples in two consecutive seasons. And I'll give you a hint. It's been a while. <laughs> it's happened recently in the American League. Carl Crawford, in fact, each of the last two seasons had 15 or more with Tampa Bay. But it has been a good long while since anybody's done what Reyes has these last two years. So it'll still take some doing for him to catch the Mets club record for triples in a season. Lance Johnson had 21. Reyes popped up his first time up today and takes ball one from Armas. I remember Lance Johnson pitching against him. He always invariably seemed to pull that ball down the first baseline, mm -hmm. past the first baseman, and 10 seconds later, dusting himself off at third. That's how he got virtually all of his triples. And he was a, a not a big guy who used an enormous bat. Shallow center field. Ryan Church is there. And Reyes retired, and that's 10 in a row for Armas to start the game. So far, it's Sandy Koufax and Bob Henley. <laughs> they hooked up in a famous duel back in 1965. Koufax for the Dodgers, Henley for the Cubs. Koufax pitched great. Henley pitched great. Henley allowed one hit and lost because Koufax pitched a perfect game. <laughs> Chavez grounded out his first time up and then he takes high. So which one is Traxel? Koufax or Henley? He wants to be Koufax. So far this year, he's uh, certainly gotten his share of run support. You, know, you don't know if these things even out over time, but you know, Traxel's due to get shut out about four times in a row. <laughs> you know, early in the season, though, you know, that complete game that he had, he was shut out in that game. Gavin Floyd, I believe, for the Phillies. Oh, the uh, the four inning complete four game. Inning complete game. <laughs> that was the game that uh, Aaron Rowan made that face jarring catch against Xavier Nady. And then earlier in the year, Traxel had a couple of games he was winning. The bullpen coughed it up. So. So you're saying maybe it already has even up. <laughs> All I know is that since the, uh, the the ninth of June, Traxel is nine and one with a 5.4 ERA. Now that's living right. And 11 more walks than strikeouts, which is living better than right. And Chavez has the first hit of the game. So Armas now playing the role of Bob Henley. <laughs> <laughs> well, Armas retired the first 10, but Chavez finally gets aboard. A little backdoor slider from Tony Armas that caught the middle of the plate. Nice hitting by Andy Chavez, and he said that. More times than we thought we were going to say it this year with Chavez and his great play. Well, pushes Chavez's average back over 300. And we'll see whether he tries to steal a base here with Beltron up. Beltron hit it hard his first time up, lining out to Ryan Church in center field. Armas very slow to the plate, and you can run on him. It's one of the things about Armas, too, we were talking about him. He's very slow to the plate, does not field his position very well, does not hit very well. So pitching is his bane. Inside to Beltron. You know, Gary, this is one thing you always see when guys have retired this many hitters in a row. Guy gets a hit, struggles a little bit with his control right away from pitching in the stretch, something he hasn't done in the entire game. Hey. 
Gets the slider over to Beltron one on one. Now when you're starting pitcher and you're warming up at the bullpen before the game, how much do you work out of the stretch? I used to always try to work out of the stretch for one inning. Pitch the three batters in the stretch and then go back. And then when you're warming up before the game, throw at least three or four pitches out of the stretch to get that feel. Chavez back. And he has 10 steals in 12 tries. Mets leading the league in steals with 114. A big part of their game all year. And one of the reasons the Mets lead the National League in runs scored. They have built so many runs with their legs. And counter that with Armas is slow to the plate, but Brian Schneider, one of the best receivers in major leagues, at throwing out runners. Great arm. Great mechanics. And almost try to compensate by throwing over and holding the ball. Well, we got a great picture there of Schneider flicking, flicking that thumb. Flicking that thumb means throw to first base. Java is getting a very big lead. Not going. And it's two and one to Beltron. If you've got a pitcher who struggles holding runners and has to expend that much energy to think about a base runner, how much does that impact the way he pitches to a big hitter at the plate? I think it really impacts him because what happens with a guy like Armas is that he starts thinking of the runner, so half of his Concentration is on Chavez, half on Beltran. You know what happens when half is on Beltran? Bad things happen. Now he's behind on Beltran, three and one. Chavez takes off, ball four. Schneider makes the throw, but it's a moot point because Beltran draws the walk, and the Mets have two men on. Always better to throw first and ask questions later if you're not sure of the umpire's call. <laughs> Tim Cheetah waited a, a beat before making his call, and so Schneider threw through. Yeah, there's a couple of umpires that will do that. I think that's not very good for Brian Schneider, of course. They should, you know, they got to know the situation and call it quickly. So the Mets with a scoring threat, first and second, and one out, and a chance for Carlos Delgado, who flied out his first time up. Delgado now 0 for 6 in this series. Had a couple of RBI chances last night that he let go by the boards. Uh, trying to get Chavez in from second base. And Carlos fouls the first one off. Delgado with 26 home runs, 74 runs batted in. But much of that production came before the end of June. There's the defense as you see Austin Kearns plays a very shallow right field one of the most shallow right fields I see in baseball particularly against a left hand power hitter like Delgado gets away from Schneider and the runners advance Chavez takes a turn but Schneider gets to it wild pitch from Armas and out two in scoring position for Delgado. Well, you talked about it, Gary. A little lack of concentration from Marmus. Almost perfect. Well, it was perfect as far as going nine up and nine down, but with his pitches right in the strike zone where he wanted it. Guy's on base now. He's bounced the ball in the dirt. He's walked to hitter. And Schneider has to go out and try to settle him down. Well, with runners at first and second, the shortstop Lopez played to the left of the second base bag. Trying to keep Beltron close. Now with second and third, he'll move over to the right side of the bag in a full over shift. Yeah, nowhere for Beltran to go. He was playing behind the bag or on the shortstop side of the bag with Chavez because of the threat of the steal. Had to keep him close. Infield back, they'll concede a run on a ground ball. And Delgado hits it back to the mound. Armas freezes Chavez, makes the play to first. Boy, 
Things are just not going well at all for Carlos Delgado. Another runner at third with less than two out that he can't get home. And it was not a great pitch. It's a pitch he should be able to handle. Fastball on the outer part. You see Chavez. He probably was going on contact, but a great play by Chavez because on contact you're supposed to go, but if you read it back to the pitcher, get back. Quick enough to do that. So two out, and it's left to David Wright, who struck out his first time up. David with 86 runs batted in, sixth in the National League. And he hits it in the air to right center, and it should get Armas through the inning. Kearns makes the catch. And so the Mets bypass an opportunity in the top of the fourth. The first opportunity either team has had. Now time to answer our Dodge trivia question. Jose Reyes, two straight years of 15 or more triples. Who was the last National League player to pull that off? And you got to go all the way back to the 30s. Big poison. Paul <laughs> Wainer. That's how special what Reyes has accomplished is. 72 years. Ooh. Here's Alfonso Soriano leading off against Steve Traxel when he takes a strike. During that span, four different American League players have had back to back years of 15 triples. Joe DiMaggio did it in the 30s. Stuffy Sternweiss, also with the Yankees during the war years in the 40s. Jim Rice. That's a little surprising. I don't think of Rice as being a speedster. It just shows you how, what a great athlete he was. Now that triangle at Fenway Park a few times. Soriano takes the curveball two and one. And Carl Crawford, as we mentioned, did it the last two years for Tampa Bay. Yeah, I had them all. I missed Stuffy Sternweiss, but uh... <laughs> he was big during <laughs> World War II. Stuffy. Two and two to Soriano, who struck out his first time up. Traxel struck out four first time through the batting order in strikeouts of. Not been a big part of Traxel's game this year. In fact, he hasn't struck out more than six in any start this season. And that came in his first start of the year. This is the first time he's facing Washington this year. And so clubs are on a deep left field. Back goes the out of here. 38 home runs for Alfonso Soriano. 1 nothing Washington. And with every home run, the numbers on that new contract next year <laughs> add another zero. Oh my. He's making himself a whole lot of cash. Career home run number 200 for Alfonso Soriano. And he takes the curtain call. Felipe Lopez rolls one to Valentin. One out. So Traxel had retired the first nine. Soriano breaks it up with a home run, much as Nick Johnson broke it up for John Main last night with a home run. Well, we've said that he can be pitched to. When you get ahead, you've got to throw the ball out of the strike zone. Traxel has used that inside fastball very, very well early in this game against the right handed hitters. Missed, and if you missed uh, just a little with Soriano, so quick inside. This is a six foot, one inch lean hitter, and he just flicked that over the fence like it was nothing. He didn't even look like he got the fat part of the bat on the ball. Yeah, Zimmerman takes a strike. You know, we always talk about pitchers that kind of like a whip. As we see Ryan Zimmerman in the batter's box, kind of being able to throw fast. Well, that's how Soriano is. He just uncoils like a whip and just slams those balls over the fence. Zimmerman fly to right his first time up. Talking about 
with Soriano closing in on another 30 30 season he's also closing in on 200 200 because he's only three stolen bases away from 200 in that department to go with the 200 home runs. Three and one to Zimmerman. Ryan Zimmerman just 21 years old. And may be right at the top of a standout crop of rookies this year. And he takes ball four. And that's the first walk in on that time. So. So one out and one on as we take a look at today's pitchers high speed brought to you by Verizon online DSL now at a great low price. Nobody cracking 90 today. At least not yet. So Nick Johnson will come up with the man aboard. Traxel struck him out first time up. Zimmerman will run occasionally. He's got nine stolen bases, but he's also been caught seven times. The Nationals are sixth in the league in steals, but their percentage is not very good. 81 steals, 47 caught. Frank Robinson loves to hit and run here, so a lot of those caught stealing is missed hit and run. One year up. Jose Vizcaino was with the Mets. Dallas Green used to hit and run with the guys behind him in the lineup all the time. I think his stolen base numbers read that year one steal, 12 caught. <laughs> Ouch. A little roller to first, and Delgado will have to settle for the out at first. As yeah, Zimmer moves to second, two away. So here's Austin Kearns with two out. Kearns popped a short his first time up. Oh, you're talking about Austin Kearns before and only hitting a home run here. Certainly this ballpark so much different than the ballpark in Cincinnati. And also Felipe Lopez and Austin Kearns were shocked by the trade that they came here. They thought they were going to be on a team that's contending which Cincinnati is. And sometimes those kind of trades affect players more than they should. Does that affect have a shelf life or does it depend on the individual? I think it depends on the individual. I'm sure that Xavier Nady has had to be going through a little bit of that over there in Pittsburgh. A lot easier to get traded up in the standings than get <laughs> traded down. Well, getting traded up can revitalize your year. If that would have more impact on a position player than it would on a pitcher. I think it'd have more impact on a position player because maybe Kearns comes over here, hits three bombs to center field, and they all stay in the ballpark. And also Frank Robinson's a little different than playing for Jerry Naren. It's a whole different situation. Could have a little thicker skin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or run every ball out, one or the other. Draxel all of a sudden having trouble getting his curveball over, and it's two and one. One nothing Washington on Soriano's home run. Seems like a nightly occurrence. <laughs> it does. Get hard. Reyes almost got knocked down and throws out Kearns to end the inning. Reyes takes the blow. Traxel down by a run as Soriano hits career home run number 200 to give the Nationals a 1 0 lead. Down from Mount Rushmore they come. But wait a second, there's an interloper. <laughs> Mr. Met was never elected president. Well, Teddy Roosevelt had an early lead, but he had a financial scandal and <laughs> dropped in the polls, and Abe oh, took advantage. Abe snuck in. He almost missed the tape. <laughs> As we check out the Lexus line score, the Nats with a 1-0 lead. 
as I say Valentine takes a strike you know they introduced that president's race here kind of a spinoff from the Milwaukee sausage race and they've been doing it here for about a month. And Teddy Roosevelt still has not won a single race. <laughs> Left it all on San Juan Hill I guess. Yes. <laughs> Valentine flight out his first trip. But that's a that's a great idea. Putting those big heads on the Mount Rushmore presidents and oh, that's great. letting them run. After all, what sausages are to Milwaukee? Presidents are here. Three and one to Valentine. Of course, some prefer the sausages. <laughs> it's not it's a nonpartisan processed meat. I don't know. In Milwaukee, the brat is the man. The brat is the food. Easy play for Kearns. And Valentin retired one away. So Tony Armas working with a lead now as the first out. This week's Mets WB 11 poll question asks: Will Jose Reyes steal more than 75 bases? It's a lot of bases. 66% said yes, 34% said no. I'd say no. I would say no also. Log on to WB11.com to vote on next week's poll. You wouldn't want him to steal that many bases. Yeah, you want him to be able to kind of in September pick his spots. 75. And keep those legs healthy for October. The day grounds one down to Nick Johnson and quickly Armas has two outs in the fifth. Always love to see what a pitcher does after being given the lead. You know we had a picture of Tony Armas sitting on the end of the bench while Traxel was out there and he was deep in concentration and I, I know personally I don't know what Tony was thinking there but whenever you get a lead like that in this kind of game where it looks like the not going to get a lot of runs scored you try to talk to yourself and say. Zero. When I go out there, I got to put up zero. Have to. And all that's standing in his way is Mike D. Felice, who rips one foul. D. Felice was in spring training with the Nationals this year. Mike was telling us the other night that he had wanted to go play in the World Baseball Classic for Italy because both his parents were born in Italy. But that the Nationals convinced him to come to camp with them, give him a chance to make the ball club. Well, he didn't play in the World Baseball Classic, and he didn't make the ball club. Brian Schneider gone playing for United States. He did the bonus work catching early in spring training, and then looked at about the middle of March, and he was down on that depth chart. Really. One felt bad that it looked like he was wasn't going to make the Nationals, which did happen, but that he really wanted to play in that World Baseball Classic for Italy. And now looking for his first hit of the season. Mike played a little bit for the Mets last year, had two hits. He had 17 at bats, and he's gone 0 for 6 this year. He's never been known for his bat. There's a nice souvenir to take back to New York with you. He's one of those backup catchers. He's known for knowing how to call a game, how to work with pitchers, accepting his role. And he takes a call, third strike. Armas has his fourth strike out of the Mets are out in order. Mets unable to get anything presidential done in the fifth. Go, Abe, go. <laughs> New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Jeep. Check out the number one selling brand of SUVs in the Northeast. Steve Traxel down one nothing as he takes the mound for the bottom of the fifth and Alfonso Soriano home run the only tally in the game. It's been a gorgeous weekend in Washington much as it has been throughout the Northeast. What a great weekend if you're a Met fan though and you have a family coming on down here for the weekend very easy to get tickets although they have 40 plus thousand 40 plus thousand yesterday and you spend the whole day seeing the monuments and 
sightseeing, go to the White House, just great. Perfect time of year to do that and great weather for it and I'm sure we'll pay for it in the next few days as the humidity comes back in as the Mets move up I-95 to Philadelphia. Ryan Church leads off in the home fifth inning, grounded out his first trip. Mets will do what they did last year on a trip from Washington to Philadelphia. They'll take the train like in the old days. Bouncer for Valentin and he throws out Church one away. This season your Tri-State Hyundai dealers and WB11 team up to help kids strike out cancer. Every strikeout recorded by a med pitcher will add $100 to the Hope and Heroes Children's Cancer Fund. If you'd like to help please call 212-305-1420 for more information. Of course, in the old days, they used to take sleeper cars from New York to St. Louis, which was the most western outpost of the big leagues. Taking an hour train ride from Washington to Philadelphia is not quite the <laughs> same thing. Marlon Anderson takes a strike, but it may be the closest we get. Well, think about it this year with the schedule. I took a train to Boston, uh, the train or subway, of course, going to Shea Stadium or Yankee Stadium, down to D.C., to Philadelphia. It's nice. When do they put in the sleeper cars on the seventh train? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny people sleeping when I'm going, when I'm on it. <laughs> uh, that hard plastic just doesn't cut it. <laughs> Got to bring a pillow. Marlon Anderson pops it up. Lots of room in foul ground. De Felice and Wright look at each other, and Wright makes the play. Two out. We were talking about it yesterday how there, there's no park in the National League that rivals this one for foul territory and the folks at Elias came up with the numbers for us. Two point two two foul outs per game at RFK the most in the National League and as we speculated Oakland the most in the majors. Now we were talking about Dodger Stadium and they used to be among the leaders but with all the seats that they put in they now get the fewest foul outs of any ballpark they've lost at least 40 feet behind the catcher they moved that whole field around moved the home plate back a little bit the fences in a little and uh, the home plate used to be forever back there I remember as a kid watching Mike Brito with that speed gun you could barely see him behind the home plate one on one to Brian Schneider as a pitcher obviously you're happy with with a lot of foul territory but does it cause you to pitch any differently. No. Um, you know. You, you, if you get the outs you're really happy and you're fortunate but you never pitch to get a foul out. One and two to Schneider. I mean, that wasn't it Wade Moggs I think. Oh jeez. Who's that Scary. young guy. <laughs> Ronald <laughs> Maurice Darling. Junior now. Age. Had the junior on there. Age. What, what were you about there? That's, I think that's an 86 pitcher. So 26 years old. Matinee idol. Yeah. It's gone awry here over the last 20 years. <laughs> two and two to Schneider. You know, it was nice enough. One of the cameramen was nice enough to bring up an 87 media guide. And the media guides in 87 are certainly not as nice as they are now. But it was interesting to see some of the people that were on the roster for the Mets that I have completely forgotten were on the roster. It's bounce foul. Well one thing about 87 if you were a pitcher in the Mets organization you had every chance of getting <laughs> to pitch in the big leagues that year with all the injuries the Mets suffered. Boy you know Dwight of course uh, went into rehab Sid hurt his knee. Cohn broke his finger in San Francisco at Lee Hamaker on a bunt. Roger McDowell had some kind of injury. I forget what it was. I think it was a leg injury. Bobby Ojeda went down. That's right. And you you were the last to go. I was the last to go. I lasted until <laughs> the middle of September. Broke your thumb. Broke my thumb in a game against St. Louis. It was the first hit of the game. Vince Coleman. Of course. Nemesis. And got in the clubhouse. I ended up getting two more outs. Hard to believe. After the after I broke my thumb, 
didn't swallow up right away. Got two more outs. Like flipped one into Tommy Hurry, hit a bomb to right field somehow. Strawberry grew about five inches and caught it. It was about to go over the fence. And went in the clubhouse. They checked it, so you have to go get, you know, an MRI or X ray or whatever. Got in the car. And as I was getting in the car, Terry Pendleton's three run home run oh. almost hit me as I was getting in my car. <laughs> Up the middle, base hit for Schneider. So there's the second hit off Traxel, and that'll enable the Nationals to clear the pitcher spot. Well, Vince Coleman inflicted a lot of damage on the Mets as a Cardinal and as a Met. <laughs> it's good. Boy, there have been some players that have come over with great renown as C. Tony Armas and his average that were supposed to do some amazing things. I think of Juan Samuel. I think of Roberto Alomar Jr. I think of Vince Coleman. And a lot of those guys did not pan out, and, and pan out is not the, the phrase. I mean, just bombed. Well, you know, Vince Coleman w was really a trendsetter in the Mets organization in that Frank Cashin, for all the early years of free agency, stayed away from free agents until Vince Coleman. As Armas flies out of the first pitch to get Traxel through the fifth inning. One nothing Washington as Armas will take the lead to the mound in the sixth. Been a pitcher's duel here in Washington. Tony Armas on top of Steve Traxel through five. And this season, the sixth inning means it's time to swing for sandwiches. If a man hits a home run this inning, you can log on to WB11.com for your chance to score a $100 gift card at Subway. Now they're breeding a whole new generation of fans here in Washington. New ownership for this team, which Oiled in obscurity in Montreal for so many years, and they moved here last year. New ownership's been in place for about a month now after Major League Baseball finally sold the team to the Lerner family. And they've already made some changes here in the ballpark. Trying to become a little more fan friendly, adding new concessions and new parking and in a ballpark that's been around since uh, the early 60s just trying to make things a little spiffier before they finish their new ballpark which should be ready for opening day in 2008 they hope. We drove by the building site on the way back to the hotel and we really have broken ground and have the pillars up already for the foundation. Going to the track so well their their schedule is a year ahead of the Mets schedule for opening the new stadium and they're building it down by the Anacostia River and there should be a, a nice view of the Capitol building if they do it the right way. You know, I built a home before. I'm always skeptical. <laughs> if you ever have gone through building a home, it's hard to believe they can ever meet the schedule. But hopefully, for both the Nationals and the Mets, it happens. Tracks are dribbles when found. Steve struck out his first time up, and right now, just trying to. Hang around in this game and get the Mets going. The Mets have not produced a whole lot of offense in this series, just seven runs in the first two games and held scoreless tonight. Today, Traxel goes down for the second time, five strikeouts for Amos. So, one away. Be part of the celebration at Shea with Mets season tickets. Prorated packages include postseason ticket purchase options and priority access for season tickets in the new Mets ballpark. To get your season tickets for the rest of 2006, call 718-507-TIXX or go to Mets.com today. So one away, here's Reyes, who's 0 for 2, started the day with an eight-game hitting streak. But Tony Armas has been just splendid. He's allowed just one hit over five and a third. And Reyes lifts one foul. You know, Gary, I was talking about the state of mind for Tony Armas after the run from the home run from Soriano. He's thinking to himself, I have to put up zeros now. Same for Steve Traxel. He's got to be thinking to himself, well, I've given up a run now. I cannot give up any more until the offense comes around. And hopefully it will come around for him. Low ground ball and Marlon Anderson makes the awkward throw. You said it last night. 
watch Marlon Anderson throw. You think something's wrong with his arms. Yeah, yeah. He throws like he's had major reconstructive surgery. But he's always thrown that yeah. way, going all the way back to the beginning of his career with the Phillies. And you know what happens for a lot of guys that have unusual ways of throwing. Usually you'll get someone to work with him to try to lengthen his arm out and, and throw and a lot of times it'll hurt a guy's arm because he's, he's been throwing like that his whole life. Here's Andy Chavez and he takes ball one. I mean, there's nothing wrong with throwing sidearm from second base. Manny Trio certainly did it very successfully but it, it, it's almost painful to watch Marlon do it. Chavez has the only hit for New York a ground single to right. It's got runners to second and third with one out in the fourth but could not convert and it's been the only time they've had base runners in this entire game. You know you go back to Lenny Dykstra the Mets always had they were always worried that Lenny the way he threw would never work out in center field but Lenny ended up being a very accurate thrower he knew where to throw the ball. Not the strongest arm but very accurate. And he knew how to get to the ball. He did it. boy it's great. Lenny didn't do it the way you teach it. You teach guys to run to a spot. Lenny would cruise on the ball, but he'd usually get there. I'm sure, he uh, nabbed many of my mistakes out there in center field. Broken bat, fly ball. Kearns moves over, and Armas has himself another one-two-three inning. He's retired eight in a row. Mets have been unable to solve Armas this afternoon. We go to the bottom of the sixth inning. Alfonso Soriano, responsible for the first run of the game, brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts. America runs on Dunkin'. Also, the only run of the game. 38th home run for Soriano, his 200th career home run. And now he leads off against Traxel in the bottom of the sixth. Soriano's had just two hits in this series, but they've both been home runs. And Traxel gets ahead of him, nothing and one. Well, when Soriano gets back in the box, you folks at home, you take a look at where his head and his left elbow are. Steve Traxel, when he looks at the plate with Soriano up, he's over half the plate. Got inside on him, and Soriano pops it up. Makes the catch. Looked like Reyes was trying to call off Wright, but Wright kept going after it, and David wound up making the catch. Well, I don't know if Wright or Reyes have a clause in their contract for putouts, <laughs> but they were fighting over this ball. Good play by Wright, though. Another foul out here at RFK Stadium. Well, this one you can see Soriano. Look at his left elbow is definitely over the inside corner of the plate. Hands and bat over the middle part of the plate. So quick inside, but good place for Traxel. Kept that one down, and it was in. Well, he better be quick inside as far over the plate as he is. Here's Lopez, and he takes a strike. Lopez over two. Well, Traxel hanging right in there. Curveball bunted foul. Did it hit him in the box? I guess it did. If you run out of the box into fair territory and get hit by that ball, you're out. Well, you know, Lopez should benefit from Davey Lopes, the first base coach from the Nationals, not only in his bunting techniques, but certainly Lopez with 31 steals should get better and better at being able to read pitchers and steal bases. Davey Lopes, of course, one of the best there ever was. You know, that part of the trade between Washington and Cincinnati, I think, was perfect for both teams. The, the Reds, who were in a race, got a veteran player in Royce Clayton, who right now is you know, more consistent defensively than Lopez is. But Lopez is so talented. You have to figure that eventually he'll be exactly what the Nationals need. The question is what happens? If and when Christian Guzman ever gets healthy. They've invested so much money in the Guzman. This is the second year of a four year contract. Guzman has two more years at around four million dollars I believe each year. 
Lopez rolls over one. A spinner down to Delgado who gets it and retires Lopez for the second out. So two out and nobody on as we check out the Toyota out of town scoreboard. The Braves leading the Brewers in the fifth. Cincinnati and Philadelphia play in the fourth. Reds pulled one out yesterday. Pittsburgh leading St. Louis. The Cardinals lead down to two and a half over Cincinnati. Houston coming fast and leading San Diego one nothing. Later on the Cubs and Rockies Mets will entertain the Rockies next weekend. Florida at Arizona the Diamondbacks just a half game out of the wild card lead and the red hot Dodgers host the Giants tonight right Dodgers have won 14 of 15. Want to know to Ryan Zimmerman. You know there are some signs that a year is going to be special for a team. The Cincinnati Reds are starting to take on the look of a team for whom maybe there's a little magic this year. And I say that because yesterday they called up Chris Mahalik. Remember him? Yeah. Soft tossing lefties pitch for Toronto. Comes out of the bullpen yesterday, throws six and two thirds innings <laughs> of relief to get the win, and the Reds outlast of the Philly. Those are the things that happen to a team when they're just having a little bit of magic in their season. Every button they push seems to work. Frank Robinson having a conversation with the bullpen. Or somebody. Or someone. <laughs> there's a couple of different phone lines in there, right? And there's a drive to the gap in right center by Zimmerman. That time cuts it off deep, but Zimmerman easily into second base with his 37th double of the year. He is having some rookie season. Just 21 years old. Well, what makes him so good and why he's a doubles machine is that he's an alley's hitter, both left center and right center. You have to play him straight up as a center fielder by the time Beltron gets to this. Good play by Beltron to even to get that, because if that gets by him, Zimmerman was thinking of maybe going to third. Now I would not even consider pitching to Nick Johnson here. No way. You got first base open. You got Austin Kearns on deck who has not been swinging the bat well. The only caveat is that Traxel has been more effective against lefties. And Austin Kearns hit the ball right on the nose in his last time up at ground ball to Jose Reyes. But Johnson proved it last night with a home run and a key single up the middle. And he'll bounce the fastball to start him off 1 0. Saying Nick Johnson proved it, you know, 258 with runners in scoring position, but he's a clutch performer. Well, he's going to be one of the cornerstones as they rebuild this franchise, signed through the 2009 season. Curve ball, and he fouls it off. Well, the cornerstones will be. Zimmerman of course and Johnson on the corners Lopez at shortstop Schneider is signed. Kearns in right field of course and make the trade Soriano if they sign him. But after that it's going to be trying to get some extra outfielders and of course pitching they've got to get some they need two guys in the rotation that'll eat up some innings. Right now they don't really have a rotation. The center field don't try and back. He runs it down. Johnson retired to end the inning. So Johnson gave it a ride, but Tracks will able to work around the Zimmerman double. Honest Abe won the race, and he's got a memorial. Go visit sometime. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Chevrolet. Announcing Chevy Sign and Drive. Visit your local Chevy dealer and leave your checkbook at home. Gorgeous sunny day here in Washington. Always good to bring the sun hat. Is that the president? <laughs> Coptering his way over the ballpark. Now the Mets offense has been in hibernation this afternoon against Tony Armas. Carlos Beltran, one of only two base runners for the Mets today. He walked in the fourth. Has struck out five, allowed just one hit. And this is a guy who, over his last eight starts, has had an earned run average over eight. And he's completed seven innings in a start once this year. 
gets ahead on Beltron one and two. And that was only his 81st pitch, so Alma should have plenty left in the tank here in the seventh. He hasn't had to do a whole lot of heavy lifting. Only one inning have the Mets even had a base run. Hit hard toward the hole, and base hit for Beltron. So there's the second hit of the game for New York, just beyond the reach of Felipe Lopez. And the Mets get the tying run aboard here in the seventh. Well, again, good hitting by Belcher, and that ball is running away off the plate down. And the only way you can get a base hit with a pitch like that is to go the other way. Nice hitting by Carlos Beltran. So for the first time in the game, the Mets have the leadoff man on. John Roush immediately up in the Washington bullpen. And you know, there's a case of, of knowing your pitcher. I mean, you know, Armas is pitching a great game here today, but as you said, Ronnie, he just doesn't go very deep in the game. This is rarefied air for him to be going this late. And Frank Robinson knows it. And we saw Frank on the phone. He probably said, if one guy gets on, get Roush up. So here's Delgado who's been struggling. And Carlos takes the inside. Delgado came up with second and third and one out of the fourth and had a comebacker to Armas. Second time in two nights he's failed to get a runner home from third with less than two out. Something that Delgado has been outstanding at for most of the year. Armas keeping the ball in tight on him, one and one. Well, this ball is off the plate in, and it's almost like Delgado in that case was. Thinking he's going to come with a fastball. Let me be quick. Try to beat him inside, but Marmus won. Lifted to left center. Soriano in. And Delgado retired one away. So Delgado now 0 for 8 in this series. One out and one on for David Wright. And David has struggled in these three games, just one for nine in the series. On Friday night, it was Billy Traber and his soft lefty tosses that held the Mets at bay. Today, it's been a very different pitcher, Tony Armas, who has pitched one of his best games of the season. Beltron with 14 steals has not been doing much running. He did leg out a triple in the game yesterday. So Beltron's knee, which has been an iffy proposition, Let's see whether it allows him to try and steal one here. We mentioned Armas and the fact that he doesn't. Get the ball to home plate in a hurry, but Chavez, when he got aboard in the fourth inning, never tried to steal. We'll say Valentin on deck. And a check swing roller. Lopez gets the force at second. Anderson's relay, though, not in time. Wright beats it out to keep the inning alive. Oh, check swing. You see, Lopez does a great job of getting rid of it quick. So does Anderson. Not enough on that throw, though, to get David right. When you bat right handed and you get out in front and just check swing, you can get out of the box a little quicker. That allowed Rice to be safe at first. Watch this. See how he gets out in front? That gets him going towards Fist first a little quicker. No chance for Washington. So, right aboard with two down. And Valentin will take a crack. And Valentin 0 for 2 today, just 1 for 9 in this series. So the Mets have not had a whole lot of offense going in these three games. They'll be going to a much more friendly offensive ballpark tomorrow night when they head up to Philadelphia. Strike one to Valentin. One nothing Washington seventh inning. Wright has 14 steals on the year. Interesting to see Nick Johnson playing off the base 
when he holds right on. If you look at Armas's pitch count. This to Met. The best thing the Mets have had going today. One and two to Valentine. I mean, he almost stole that presidential race. <laughs> Well, Armas has done a good job of pitching inside all day long. This slider, though, runs in off the plate, Valentin. Again, Johnson not in contact with the bag, just standing in, in front of the bag. And, and it makes you think he has to reach that much further to try and make a tag. It tells me that he does not concerned at all with the pickoff attempt. He's concerned with getting it off the base to try to get in position in case Jose Valentin pulls one down to first base. On one and two, right runs. Schneider with the throw. It goes into center field, and the right will get up and go to third. And now the tying run is at third with two out. 15th stolen base for Wright. Schneider's error moves into third. Well, this throw just sails. What happens is when a pitcher takes a long time to deliver the ball, catchers sometimes over rush, rush too quickly, and that's why it ended up with that throw. Schneider really should have been a little more careful. If he got the stolen base, let him have it. Valentin looking for the two out hit. But he grounds one right to Marlon Anderson who boots the ball. Valentin is safe as the ball gets away and the Mets have tied the game. Routine ground ball and Marlon Anderson booted it. And the Mets taking advantage of two Washington errors tie up the ball game here in the seventh. Frank shaking his head. Sometimes what happens is that he kind of looked up there, ball got in on him, and he doesn't have the kind of quick release and arm speed and power to get Jose Valentin at first. To Valentin was hustling down that line, even though it was a routine grounder. And that's why he beat it. So the Schneider error set it up. The Anderson error brings the run in. 1 1 game. Ricky Lede pulls one foul. And just when it looked like Armas had thrown a seventh shutout inning, the Mets get a gift run. In these games, that's what happens. These one nothing games, sometimes an error just changes the whole course of the action. You thought that the Armas had the Mets at bay. And the day watches wide, one on one. Think about it this way. Tony Armas, we're talking about the rarefied air. 140 second start today has never had a major league complete game. That's hard for me to believe. This will be his 95th pitch of the day. And the day takes a tie, two and one. And Frank Robinson has seen a lot. More than he'd like to yeah. at times. From a team that's just not built to win right now. Two and two to the day. Day looked confused on this fastball running away from. Him. See that right hip clearing? Looks like he's trying to pull it. What happens with Armas who's been throwing so many pitches inside? Today just one for seven in his career against Ramos. Valentin at first with two down. Ricky Today making just his second start as a Met. One for eight in a Mets uniform. Side three and two. So that'll be an automatic start for Valentin with three and two and two down. Mike DeFelice hitting eighth in the order on deck. Wonder if Lede can keep the inning going. Would really consider batting for DeFelice. Try and we'll get that lead run home. Back 
Valentin runs. Lede bounces it right to Nick Johnson on the bag, and that ends the inning. But the Mets tally an unearned run, taking advantage of two Washington errors, one of them by Marlon Anderson to tie the game. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Sterling Max and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Sterling Max. We go to the bottom of the seventh inning as we take a look at our Lexus line score. There has not been much offense today. Mets have had just two hits off Tony Armas. The Nationals with only three off Steve Traxel. Soriano's home run in the fourth gave the Nationals the lead. The Mets tying it up with an unearned run in the top of the seventh after Marlon Anderson booted a routine ground ball. And like he might have had a few words of apology for Tony Armas after the inning. I, I think that's a nice thing to do. Um, but I mean, you know, he's not trying to. You know, you know, I never needed to hear that because uh, I know that no one's trying to make an error. That happens. That's part of the game. You know, there's a lot of time, and, and Armas picked him up by not allowing another run. That's going to happen a lot of times that Anderson's going to make a nice play for Armas to get him out of an inning. So I never needed that, but I, I understand what he's doing. So now Traxel will soldier on into the bottom of the seventh. He's had himself a terrific afternoon, but. After many a start of massive run support, Traxel had to make do with the minimum here today. It was nice of Mr. Met to make the trip. Yes. He, um, he came here along with several other area mascots to uh, honor Screech, the Washington mascot. Screech is, well, he's an owl. And I just wonder why an owl is the Nationals' mascot. Shouldn't a bald eagle? Oh, he's an eagle. I think he's. A, I think. I think he's a bald eagle. Oh, he looks like an owl. To yeah. Me. Yeah. There he is. No, that's not. That's oh. the Blue Jays' mascot who came in for the occasion. <laughs> one, one. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bad mascot guy. I'm telling you. <laughs> Scouts are okay, except Fred Bird. Fred Bird, no. Fred Bird's just off. I mean, I can even take the pirate parrot. Yeah, but Fred Bird, he's going to do some squats. He's only doing upper body when he goes into the. There's Screech. Bald eagle? He looks like an owl to me. I, I, I don't see eagle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that makes more sense then. Turns the other way, and long run for Chavez, but he'll get there. Chavez got a great jump on that ball. Well, you said it, Gary. He did get a great jump off the bat. Austin Kearns knows he's got a double on this one down the line. And it's not that Andy Chavez makes the great plays, it's how easy he makes those plays. That is a double most right fielders. Chavez has just done everything right this year. He's always been considered a good outfielder, but what he's done offensively and what he's done with his throwing arm, he's just had himself a tremendous year. Here's Ryan Church with one out. And he takes a fastball for a strike. Church is grounded out twice, both times to Valentine. Jackson with a very reasonable pitch count here in the seventh inning, about to throw his 89th pitch. This is with the splitter one and one. Tom Glavin pushed himself to 123 pitches in his start night before last. Popped up by Church. Right again, struggling with the sun, and Reyes comes over, and that's the second out. Well, Gary, you know that there's pitch counts and there's pitch counts, and you know it's been pretty. Easy, but it's been re more relaxed for Traxel on his pitch counts today than has been in the past when he's had a lot of base runners. Really, one run scored on one pitch. Other than that, he's been very effective. Not many balls hit hard off him. Maybe the home run, of course. Austin Kearns. The 
There's Marlon Anderson who'd love to make up for his error. That produced the tying run. And he takes the fastball low. Tracks will hit 90 maybe for the first time today. As Royce Ring gets up in the Mets bullpen. As a fastball strike, one on one. Marlin is over to grounded out and fouled out. Well, Traxel's thrown a lot more fastballs today, Gary, and I think he just he knows he's got a good one. Comes right back to it toward the hole. Reyes can't get it, and Anderson has a two-out single. Just beyond Reyes's reach. It'd been interesting if Reyes caught that ball. If he would have had a play on Anderson because he got to it. With the dive, ball just goes underneath his glove. Anderson's got good speed, though. So there's the fourth hit off Traxel. And Brian Schneider will come up with a runner aboard. You have to assume if Schneider gets on, the Nationals would hit for Armas, who's thrown 98 pitches. But nobody as yet has come out on deck. Schneider, one for two. He singled up the middle his last time up. Been swinging the bat a little bit better after a season long struggle. And Anderson back to the bat. Darrell Ward, big slugging left hand batter, comes out on deck to pinch hit for Armas if Schneider can keep it going. He's done a good job off the bench, too, for the Nationals. Three pinch hit home runs so far this season. Anderson has just two stolen bases. You don't think of him as a, a stolen base threat. Want to know to Schneider. Steve Traxel today trying for his 12th win. Before last night, nobody in the National League had more than 12 wins, but. Last night, both Brad Penny of the Dodgers and Brandon Webb of the Diamondbacks won their 13th. It really would be a long shot for anybody in the National League doing 20 this year. 2 0 to Schneider. Good job by DeFelice coming out here. You have to remind your pitcher managing the game as a starter. You have a hitter up here who's had a tough year, batting 231. Don't be too careful with this guy. Just go after him, throw a good quality pitch in a good spot. And as he has done most of the year, he's not been able to produce hits as Brian Schneider. So you want to be aggressive here. You don't want to face Ward. You got a ring up in the bullpen as a prospective reliever to face Ward. And Chad Bradford's now up alongside Ring. 2 0 to Schneider. Came right after him, 2 1. There's Bradford. Billy Wagner wandering into the picture. <laughs> What's he doing? I know, he's like, where's Waldo as he's walking across there? He's been going for gum. See, Willie Randolph, he is saying, hey, be alive out there in left field, Ricky Dave. Schneider's trying to go to the left side. Two and one, he misses away. And now tracks him behind three and one. He's walked only one batter today. Struck out four. All of those came first time through the batting order. All those back bends. Remember, Steve had back surgery last year. Would you send Anderson on three and one? I'm Schneider. You know. If anyone is going to do it, it'll be Frank Robinson. Very aggressive manager, not by the book, really manages by feel. He's going. Pulled through the hole and into right field base hit. Anderson goes first to third. And now the Nationals have the lead run at third with two out.
So Willie Randolph pondering his choices here. Traxel's given up back to back two out hits and now slugging Daryl Ward comes up to pinch hit. Well, there comes Willie and he wants Royce ring. So Traxel will not get a win on this afternoon. This call to the bullpen is brought to you by Singular Wireless raising the bar. Royce ring will come on for New York. Royce ring will come on in relief for New York while he gets ready. Let's check in with Chris Cotter. Chris. Hey Gary you know you mentioned during the game that one of the things that has been characteristic of Steve Traxel all year has been his very few strikeouts. Well the other thing has been his inability to go very deep into games. Now it's not that uncommon in this day and age but Trax has only gone seven innings or more twice this whole year and in this past 11 games his 11 starts where he's nine and one. He's only gotten more than six innings once. This is the second time this six and two thirds today. Most he has gone since the beginning of June. All right, Chris and Royce Ring will come on to pitch for the first time since Tuesday against San Diego. Now, Daryl Ward has had a great year pinch hitting, but he only has eight at bats against lefties this year, one for eight. And he's being left in to face Ring. He bounces the first one, and Dee Felice knocks it down to save a run. Well, Royce Ring has only been up a week. He hasn't pitched in five days. The one thing you've noticed a couple of times that he's appeared is that he hasn't been that sharp with his control. That has been definitely a problem and something that DeFelice, the catcher, is going to have to battle here with Marlon Anderson on third base. When he came in the game on Tuesday night against San Diego, he gave up a double to the first man he faced, Adrian Gonzalez. Can't afford to do that here in a tie game. Comes sidearm and misses, and it's 2 and 0. Soriano on deck and if he comes up almost certainly Chad Bradford would be in to face him. So this is rings one batter. And he's behind Ward 2 and 0. You know when the relievers come in and go 2 and 0 on the first hitter. He'll get the manager talking to himself. Load the bases for Soriano, which would put Bradford in a rather difficult situation. You know, the manager waits for his shot to give a guy a spot to get an out, put him in a real good situation, and when he goes three and zero, it makes him shake his head. Ball four, so Ring walks Ward on four pitches. Bases are loaded for Soriano and Ring can go take a shower. Willie's going to make a double switch here because the pitchers do up second when the Mets come to bat in the eighth. So Michael Tucker's coming in the game. So is Chad Bradford. Ring exits after the walk. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Hyundai. Take the Hyundai Challenge. Visit the HyundaiChallenge.com. By T-Mobile. Get more minutes, more features, more service. By Nissan. Visit the Nissan Bottom Line sales event before September 5th. By Men's Warehouse. You're going to like the way you look. And by Land Rover. Experience the highly advanced Land Rover L3 at LandRoverUSA.com. Double switch for the Mets. Michael Tucker comes in to play left field. He'll bat ninth. Chad Bradford on to pitch. He'll bat seventh. Well, Chad Bradford in a difficult situation facing the Nationals' best hitter, Alfonso Soriano. Good low ball hitter, and that is his strength, Chad Bradford. But he's done an outstanding job for the Mets all year long. Marlon Anderson at third base. Brian Schneider at second and a pinch runner Damian Jackson comes in to run for Daryl Ward at first base after Ward drew the walk from Royce Ring. Well here's Soriano who's accounted for the only Washington run today with his 38th home run of the year. And he's done well against Bradford five for 14 in his career. Bases loaded two down one one game last of the seven. Traxel retired the first two hitters in this inning. But two hits and a walk have loaded him up for Soriano. And Bradford 
throws a fastball for a strike. Soriano with three career grand slams. You have to love the aggressiveness uh -huh. by Bradford. And the slider misses one and one. Just one of those pitchers. He's been through the mix with the Oakland A's. Has some time pitching in playoff games, big, big time games. He knows that strike one out of the bullpen is the most important pitch. Stranded 32 out of 41 inherited runners this year. And he's got three more big ones aboard here. With as dangerous a hitter as there is in the league right now standing at the plate. Gets behind two and one. And unusual patience from Soriano. <laughs> I was going to say, usually he swings at that pitch, but just a little too low inside for him to swing at. Two one to Soriano. Swings over that sinker. Two and two. Bottom just dropped out of that. Soriano's head coming out of there, trying to do some big damage. Now you're in a strange situation here. It's two and two, and you know if you throw something out of the strike zone, you got a 90% chance he's going to swing at it, but you don't want to go to three two in case he chooses not to. Base is loaded. Two two to Soriano. Chopper over the mound. Valentine, can he get him at first? Scooped, got him. Picked out of the dirt by Delgado. Side retired. Chad Bradford comes on to get the out. Valentine and Delgado hook up to make it happen. And the Mets keep it tied. Rubber game of the series in Washington and a tremendous pitchers duel today between Steve Traxel and Tony Armas. Alfonso Soriano finally broke the ice with a home run. Mets got even with an unearned run when Marlon Anderson couldn't pick up a grounder but then a bases loaded situation dodged as Soriano retired. Valentin throwing him out to end the bottom of the seventh. Well, what a fine play. The runner in front of him, the umpire had to get down, throwing across his body. Great play by Valentin, a pick by Delgado. And the thing about Soriano, he has that big swing, has that little delay until he starts running and sprinting down first base, tried to turn it on too late. You know, I can see that he has the delay because he has the big swing, but he didn't run hard the first half of the way to first base. And how can you not in a situation like that where you know if you beat it out, your team's going to take the lead? Because you don't recognize the situation. It's all about hitting a home run or hitting the ball hard somewhere. It almost like he anticipated Valentin was going to make a play at second, so it's never going to come to first. And all of those assumptions, dead wrong. I mean, when you watch the play develop, it took so long for that ball to get to Valentin and for him to get rid of it that when you refocused on first base you figured at least it was going to be a bang bang play but he got Soriano by a pretty good margin. John Roush now pitching for the Nationals. He's only given up one run in his last 13 appearances as he has established himself out in that bullpen with Cordero. Mike DeFelice fouls it away or uh, Paul Duca batting for DeFelice. The Mets trying to get some offense going here in the eighth inning and LaDuca who had the day off being used as a pinch hitter. End of day off. <laughs> Darren Oliver getting ready in the bullpen. That will happen in a 1 1 game. Tucker batting ninth in the order out on deck. Came out of the double switch with Bradford. And LaDuca hits one in the air foul. That'll go out of play. Well, Rouse pitched in the first game a Nationals victory and had runners in second and third and two outs in the eighth inning. Was able to strike out Paul LaDuca.
believe that at bat he went 0 and 2 and went back to 3 and 2 with three straight balls. And was able to throw a fastball by him at 3 2. And the Duke has said, I can't believe I missed him. Breaking ball fouled off. Fastball just off the plate. All that Paul generally makes contact on. He has a tremendous amount of confidence in his ability to make contact with just about anything. And with two strikes. Mm -hmm. That's why he rarely strikes out. <laughs> the short stop. Lopez fields it. And throws out Laduca one away. So one out and nobody on. We check out the Toyota out of town scoreboard. Angels lead the Yankees in the sixth. The Yankees two games up on the Red Sox who are 4 4 in the fourth. Cleveland looking for their sixth straight win after they slept, swept a doubleheader yesterday. The White Sox leading the wild card by two games over Boston, trying to hand the Tigers their fifth straight loss and sweep that series. And Minnesota up 2 0 on Toronto in the fourth. Oakland stretched their lead to four and a half in the West. They play later on. Here's Tucker, and he hits one to deep right center. Back goes Burns, looking up, and it's out of here. Michael Tucker with his first home run as a New York Met has given the Mets the lead in the top of the eighth inning. Michael Tucker brought in on the double switch, sees one pitch, and hits his first home run of the season. Two to one, New York. Well, Met fans, Met players, and Willie Randolph with that smile, really enjoying that double switch. Michael Tucker jumped on John Rouse, who was trying to get ahead. With that first pitch strike, he was going to be waiting for it and powdered this ball to right center over a year. Since Tucker's last home run in the big leagues, this one as big as it gets. Well, he waited a long time for that. Tucker, who was released by Washington during spring training this year, gets an opportunity to play against his old team. He contributed a sacrifice fly last night and walked a couple of times as a starter. And here, his first home run. That'll make you smile. <laughs> Owen to Reyes and he takes the breaking ball on the dirt. And you know Tucker's a guy who's 35 years old. He, he's been around in the big leagues for 10 years. And all of a sudden he finds himself out of a job this spring. He signs with the Mets, goes to AAA, plays every day, no complaint, just to try and get an opportunity like this. Well, if they're seeing a Michael Tucker is trying to pass this test. Question one. Yeah, right. Correct. You know, and the biggest question may be, can he come off the bench for you and get a big hit and a big spot in a postseason game? Well, he just came off the bench. He got a big hit. Two to Reyes, slapped it foul. The Mets have a lot of questions to answer at the corner outfielder spots. Question one is, will Cleft Floyd stay healthy? Number two is, can Lasting's Millage play every day in the big leagues right now? And number three is, if they're not, who does? And at some point, those questions have to be answered because you cannot go into important games, playoff games in October with those kind of question marks in the outfield. And the luxury the Mets have is that they have 48 games remaining in the regular season after today and plenty of time to figure out those answers because they're not likely to play another quote unquote meaningful game until October. Zimmerman shading his eyes and he stays with it to retire Reyes two out. So two away here's Andy Chavez Mets have had only three hits in this game Chavez has one of the three 
Michael Tucker has the most important one. Darren Oliver getting ready to pitch the bottom of the eighth. Aaron Howman pitched the eighth inning last night and he's gotten the majority of the opportunities with the Mets leading, but Willie Randolph has said all along he's not going to get all of them. And apparently not today as Chavez fouls the first one off. Well, day game after a night game, maybe given the Highland a day off. Four big games in Philadelphia. Big games, I mean that they're playing against a team that is fighting for the wild card. Philadelphia is still involved. They're going to be playing hard, and Heilman is going to have to get some big outs during that four game series. Going to the Chavez. Beltron waiting on deck. John Rausch and Chad Cordero have been the most reliable relievers for the Nationals this year, but Cordero's given up 11 home runs and Rausch has now given up nine. That's a lot of home runs from the last two guys in the bullpen. They both like their fastball, they both throw their fastball a lot, they both have a very straight fastball. One and two to Chavez. And Michael Tucker was ready for that fastball. And Tucker's first home run as a Met has given the Mets a one run lead. And now it's up to the bullpen to try and hang on to it. And Chavez strikes out of the slider to end the inning. Michael Tucker brought in in a double switch. And he switches the tenor of this ball game by crushing one off John Roush to give the Mets the lead. If you thought facing a Billy Wagner heater was tough, how'd you like to face off against one of these guys? Catch the WWE SmackDown every Friday night starting this fall right here on the home of the new CW11. Well, Chad Bradford now pitcher of record on the long side. He got the big out in the bottom of the seventh. Beneficiary of the Michael Tucker home run in the top of the eighth. And now he'll stay on to face Felipe Lopez leading off in the bottom of the eighth. And Lopez takes a strike. Lopez strike out two ground outs 0 for three. And takes the slider one and one. We've talked about it before but Chad Bradford has that little move where he'll set for a while before going to the plate but he also will have that quick pitch where he goes to the plate. And he gets ahead on Lopez one and two. All done to try to foil the timing of the hitters. There's that quick pitch, and it's two and two. Remember, Tom Seaver used to have a move where you know Tom used to go over the top of his head, and sometimes he'd go over it twice to try to foil the hitter. I always thought that was an interesting move. I tried it once, and it almost threw the ball over the backstop, <laughs> so it didn't really work for me. Pulled a Len Barker. <laughs> On the inside corner, strike three call. Bradford coming inside with the fastball, and he gets Lopez looking one away. Oh, a big out for the Mets, and Chad Bradford threw a backdoor curveball, backdoor slider, came back with a fastball in. As we check out the Jeep game summary, Steve Traxel was good today. Tony Armas was better. They both go away with a no decision. Soriano hit the home run to break the scoring ice and Michael Tucker with the home run that has given the Mets the lead. Here's Ryan Zimmerman. He's walked and doubled today one for two. Goes the other way and rifles a foul. Soriano's hit all the home runs, but Zimmerman has probably had the biggest hits for the Nationals this year. He's had a had a period of time over a week where I think he had three walk-off hits or home runs. Nick Johnson on deck. That's keeping Darren Oliver busy in the bullpen in case they need him to face the lefty. And Zimmerman got tied up in knots, but he held the swing in time, two and one. 
<laughs> Recreating his little dance step. Paranoia. <laughs> I thought it was a slider. That fastball ran in. Down foul down to Tony Beasley, the Nationals third base coach. And a very nice hop on one, a uh, stop on one hop. There's a certain talent as a baseline coach. You have to know which balls you can handle <laughs> and which ones you can't. Because you don't want to look bad. In the left field, a base hit for Zimmerman. And so the Nationals have the tying run aboard. And we'll see what Willie does here. You've got the lefty Johnson coming up. Right hand hitter Kearns behind him. And Willie's going to bring in the lefty apparently to face Nick Johnson. So Bradford certainly did his job. He got the big out in the seventh and got the first batter here in the eighth. Now it's up to Oliver to try and keep the Mets in the lead. This call to the bullpen brought to you by Singular Wireless, raising the bar. Darren Oliver getting the eighth inning call as Bradford departs. Well, he's flown under the radar for most of the year, but Darren Oliver has had a spectacular season out of the Mets bullpen. He has, and here now getting, trying to get two big outs here in the eighth inning, facing Nick Johnson, best left-handed hitter for the Nationals. Oliver has just made that transition, a starter for most of his career, career and did not say a word. Said, just give me the ball when you need me to get an out. I'll be ready whether it's four innings of relief, which he's done this year, or whether it's one third of an inning. And just a fantastic job for Willie Randolph and his staff. And as Oliver has thrived, he's been thrust into a more and more important role. He was working mostly as a long man earlier in the year, occasionally as a left handed specialist, had been getting some seventh innings lately. Now, all of a sudden, here he is in the eighth inning to face Nick Johnson, who is just one for eight against Oliver in his career. Oliver with those cutters and sliders does keep the ball down. He, uh, Johnson a candidate for a ground ball here. Opening for the double play. Runner goes and is hit to center field. Beltran with lots of room out there. And uh, Zimmerman forgot how many outs there were. <laughs> he winds up at third base. It'll be an easy double play. Zimmerman with a brain cramp. And Delgado steps on first to complete the double play. Side retired. Oh, uh, Frank Robinson won't like that. A gift for the Mets as Zimmerman forgot how many out there were. Want to see a man fume? Just look at Frank. Well, didn't Casey Stengel say once, can't anybody play this game? Well, hit and run on the first pitch. Darren Oliver to Nick Johnson. Zimmerman just completely forgot how many outs there were. Something you wouldn't think he would do, but you're going to play a long career, and he's had a short career now. But if you're going to play a career, you're going to have these moments. It's got to be the loneliest feeling in the world when the third base coach says, "Uh, kid." <laughs> That's only the second out. Now you've just made the third. So the Mets get a break there to keep their two-to-one lead. Now they're looking to expand it. Here in the top of the ninth, and Carlos Beltran takes ball two from John Rausch. You know, it's Frank Robinson. Well, to play that bad, he will not say anything because he knows, you know. What can you say? He can't be more embarrassed than Ryan Zimmerman, Zimmerman is right now. <laughs> two and on to Beltran. Well, Ryan Zimmerman is 21 years old. And the good thing about a play like that is. It won't happen to him again, yeah. at least for a long, long time. That's three and one to Carlos, who got the Mets tying rally started in the seventh with a base hit. Mets would eventually score the tying run on an error by Marlon Anderson, and then take the lead in the eighth on Michael Tucker's home run. Ball four to Beltron, and he's on leading off tonight. So Beltron on base for the third time today. First walk given up by Roush. And another chance for Carlos Delgado. Been a rough day for Carlos. 0 for 3. He's gone 0 for 8 in this series. 
and over a longer stretch three for his last 31. But he made a nice pick on the throw by Valentin on Soriano's ground ball that stranded three in the seventh. Saul Rivera up in the bullpen for Washington. And Delgado hits one of the gap in right center field, but over goes Church, and he runs it down. Church got a nice break on that ball, and Beltran, who thought that ball was going to drop, had to hustle to get back to first base. Well, this ball just scorched, but Church was playing Delgado the pull. He did get a great jump. Church is not a fast center fielder, but he does get great jumps as Beltran almost pulled a Zimmerman. Now he thought that ball was going yeah. to drop when it was hit. But he was able to change direction and get back. It's a great speed can do for you. So one out and one on. Here's David Wright. David 0 for 3. But he scored the tying run in the seventh, reached on a force play, stole second, took third on a throwing error by Schneider, and then came home on Anderson's error. And a pitch out, but. Beltran's going nowhere. And unlike Soriano, David Wright busting it out of the box on that attempted double play by the Nationals. They couldn't turn it. And okay. error by Anderson later in his high score. It's amazing. Those little things can play such a difference in a game. Soriano runs hard to first base. This might be an entirely different affair. One and one to David Wright. But you know, that's why you don't blink. Before signing David Wright to a long term contract. Yeah. Soriano, for all his talent, and he's an enormously talented player, you'd have to think twice before giving him the, the five years and the $80 million that he's probably going to get from somebody this offseason. Because you're going to have those moments where he does things like that. Listen, running hard to first, you can go an entire year. Where you're not rewarded, nothing positive happens for your team. But the one time you don't is the time that it invariably seems that it costs your team. And Roush paying a lot of attention to Beltron over at first base. For a base hit. Beltron stops at second, and the Mets have two men on for Jose Valentin. So, right with his first hit of the afternoon. Rush, pretty good slider, had right out in front, kind of just flicked that into the left field. That is only the Mets' fourth hit of the game. If you can win a game with four hits, that's pretty good. But you don't do it very often. Well, the Mets would love to get some insurance before they head to the bottom of the ninth. And Valentin arrived at home plate with a broken bat. <laughs> Worked for Andrew Jones. Not a good way to start the at bat, though. Yeah, it's one thing if you break your bat in the course. <laughs> Of the at bat, but to start out with a broken bat it is probably just putting yourself behind the eight ball. And to explain that, Andrew Jones earlier in the week hit a fly ball to center field. The bat broke. He just had the handle in his hand as he's running down to first base, and it was a home run. Mm -hmm. That's a strong man. <laughs> man. Valentino 0 for 3 today. They'll try and ride aboard with one out. Rush misses away. Now, Tony Armas was fantastic today. Probably the best we've seen him in a long time. Seven innings, two hits, an unearned run. But he'll get a no decision for that, just as Traxel will for his fine effort today. Valentin pops one foul. Will Zimmerman have a play on it? Nope, it's in the crowd. One and one to Valentin.
sunny day. Nice ball game and a souvenir to boot. Beltron at second, right at first with one out. Second and third. Well, John Roush having some trouble here in the eighth, in the ninth inning, and the Mets now have two in scoring position for Valentin. Well, you talked about it before, Gary. As you see this wild pitch, no chance for Schneider. They have struggled so much with their middle relievers. They've got the bridge who pitched the, sixth, the eighth inning, and they got to keep them in for the ninth inning because they don't have any confidence in anyone else down there except for Chad Cordero. And of course you use a guy like that for two innings in a game where you're behind and and tomorrow they might have a lead and not be able to go to him. the infield comes in one and one to Valentine uh, two and one to Valentine and he lifts one to right that'll get a run home Beltron tagging at third as Kearns grabs it Beltron comes in to score as Kearns throw goes past third and it goes up against the dugout and a right goes to third base. Sacrifice fly for Valentin brings in the run. Wright was going to hold it second, but on the air, he moves over to third. Frank just fumes a little bit more. Well, as a right fielder, Kearns knows he cannot throw up Beltran at home, so he unleashes this throw. Trying to see in case Wright goes, but just a bad play all around. Did not hit the cutoff man. And as a pitcher, John Roush should know maybe to back up third because it's not going to be a play at the plate. I did not see where he was. Was he backing up home? He was backing up home, yeah. But as a pitcher, if you know how the game is played, Beltran is at third. No way you can come home to get him. You back up third. Frank Robinson to the mound and that's going to be all for John Roush. This call to the bullpen brought to you by singular wireless raising the bar. Roush exits and Saul Rivera on to pitch for Washington. Right hander Saul Rivera takes over the pitching for Washington. Rivera pitched two perfect innings last night and right back out there today. Well, we talked about it before. Not a lot of confidence in a lot of the guys down there. Chris Schroeder yesterday gave it up to the Mets. So Frank going with those pitchers he has confidence in. Saul Rivera in today. And Julio Franco will bat for the pitcher hitting in the seventh spot in the order. John Roush done after an inning and two thirds. David Wright at third base after the throwing error by Austin Kearns. A run home here in the ninth. And Franco takes a strike. So the Mets editing an insurance run on a walk, a single, a wild pitch, and a sacrifice fly. And Billy Wagner, who picked up save number 27 last night, getting ready to try and notch another today. And that one's knocked down by Schneider to keep another run from scoring. Well, there was a time not too long ago, as you see, Schneider does a good job of. It's a tough slider off the plate, blocks it with his chest protector, keeps it close enough to keep right at third base. It was a time not too long ago when Billy Wagner and people around the team were concerned he wasn't getting enough save chances. You know how streaky that can be? As soon as you say that, then they start coming in droves. It's all about getting leads, playing close games. You know, the Mets were winning blowout games. They had a stretch where they they lost 11 of 17 right before the 4th of July. But now they're back in that that mode that they were in early in the season and all of a sudden. Billy is out there and you know he's never been more dominant this year than he was last night. it will be interesting to see if he can double up on that day game after a night game. Franco goes the other way Kearns moves over. And that retires the side, but the Mets add a run. 
Insurance for Wagner, who will go to the mound with a two-run lead in the bottom of the ninth as the Mets try to win the rubber game here in D.C. Billy Wagner on to try for his 28th save of the year. Well, Billy Wagner, last night we talked about it a little before. Could not have been more dominant. Used the inside part of the plate and the outside part of the plate. Day game after a night game. Trying to see if he can do it two days in a row. These are the kind of things that happen in October that you have to be dominant. Night game. Well, there's mostly night games now in the postseason, but over and over and over is Laduca behind the dish. Ball came on as a pinch hitter in the top of the eighth, right before Michael Tucker hit the go ahead home run. Austin Kearns leads off in the last of the ninth. Kearns 0 for 3 on the day, 1 for 9 in this series. And he takes a strike from Wagner. Nothing and 1. Billy just getting loose. First one at 89, second one at 96. <laughs> Nothing in two to Kearns. Ryan Church is due up next. One and two to Kearns. Frank Robinson has Alex Escobar in the dugout as potential right handed pinch hitter, but Looks like Church will bat. And the slider just inside, two and two to Kearns. Wagner struck out two and got a ground ball in his stint last night. As Kearns fouls it off, Wagner's now struck out 72 batters in 54 and a third innings. You know, I've said it a couple times before in their history Mets have had some amazing relievers Jesse Roscoe Tug McGraw Benitez Johnny Franco but never with the kind of swagger that Billy Wagner gives them. and that's an important word swagger because it's what we talked about with Pedro Martinez coming to the Mets last year it's not only being good it's projecting that you're good. That on my worst day I'm going to beat you. On my best day I'm going to dominate you. On my real great day I'm going to embarrass you. Two and two to Kearns. And it's keeping the bat alive. Billy doesn't look like he has the same kind of dominating stuff today that he did last night. Ball's a little up in the strike zone too. He was really around the knees all of last night. Marlon Anderson, whose error allowed the Mets to tie the game, third batter due up in this inning. 2 2 to Kearns. Grounded to right. And his throw on target went away. So one out on the last of the ninth. And here is Church, who's gone 0 for 3 today. A little surprised to see Frank Robinson keeping his right hand hitters in the dugout. Not only do you have the righty lefty matchup with Escobar, he got some nice speed. Might be able to beat out a base hit, infield base hit. And you have the switch hitting Bernie Castro in the dugout as well, available as a right handed bat. He beat out an infield hit last night. Oh. Oh. I mean, you don't have a great chance as a right hand batter against Wagner but you have a little better chance. Here's Escobar. And Church watches the slider one and one. Steve Traxel started went six and two thirds allowed a run on five hits and no decision for him. This game is so funny sometimes isn't it. <laughs> Two and one to Church. I mean, Traxel's had outings where he's given up four or five runs and gotten wins during this stretch, but today he was tremendous, allowed just one run, and he gets a no decision. So solid today. 
He had a game in San Francisco, but this is one of his best efforts all year. And Church fouls off the fastball, and it's two and two. Royce Ring faced one batter, walked him. Chad Bradford bailed him out by getting a huge ground ball from Soriano with the bases loaded to end the seventh. Bradford in line for the win. Darren Oliver threw one pitch and got two outs. When Ryan Zimmerman forgot how many out there were. And now Wagner trying to finish it up. Fastball in there for a call strike three, and Church knew it. Must have been looking for a slider. It took a 98 mile an hour fastball down the middle. He can be looking for a fastball and take a 98 <laughs> mile an hour fastball down the middle. Good paint by Billy Wagner. So two out and nobody on. And the Nationals down to their final out of the afternoon. Mets trying to go to 26 games over 500 for the first time this year. Marlon Anderson one for three. And fouls the first pitch off from Wagner. And that's looking to go 36 wins on the road. That's more than they had all of last year and 13 over 500 on the road. Tomorrow night in Philadelphia Pedro Martinez will be on the mound against the rookie lefty Cole Hamels. And Wagner now one strike away from nailing this one down. Just overmatched here. Tomorrow, Anderson with that fastball to win back in. A little high, one and two. Looks like Billy's just getting loose. <laughs> One two to Anderson. That just missed two and two. Where was that? <laughs> Says Willie. Two two pitch. This is with the slider, and it's three and two to Anderson. Now, walk to Anderson to bring the tying run to the plate. Brandon Harper has come out on deck to bat for Brian Schneider if that happens. Harper, a right hand batter. Three two to Anderson. Line drive, base hit, and the Nationals are alive. So, Marlon Anderson with his second hit of the day. Harper made it all the way to home plate, but now he's being called back into the dugout. And it looks like it's going to be Escobar instead. So Alex Escobar, who has more power than Harper, in a situation where a home run could tie the game, we'll get the call here with two out to runner at first. So the former Met prospect who started the first two games of this series and went one for seven will get the call here against Billy Wagner. Two out last of the night. And Escobar swings at the slider, nothing at one. Aggressive, well, you bet. Well, that just isn't fair. You're thinking that you're going to go up and face it's Billy Wagner, who throws 98 miles an hour. So you're going to get the head out, cheat a little bit, and pulls the string with a slider. Laduca setting up away. And the fastball misses away, one and one. Like a little two seamer there from Wagner. You no, know? <laughs> that ball had a lot of run on it. You're right. I don't think he's going to be throwing his second best fastball at this point, though. And Escobar watches the A heater, but that misses two and one. So Wagner, after retiring the first two, got to work around a hiccup. 
Interesting choice for Wagner here. Escobar is going to be swinging if he sees anything fast. He looks at a fastball. Slider, a little high, and it's three and one. A walk would put the tying runs on base, and Brandon Harper, who has spent now a career on deck, remember he was on deck when the game ended yesterday. He was on deck and got almost to home plate before Escobar was set up, and maybe he really will bat. <laughs> Three one to Escobar. Low ball four. And now the tying runs are aboard. And Willie Randolph's going to take a trip to the mound here and have a little talking to with Billy Wagner. We've seen Willie make trips to the mound, but I don't think we've ever seen him go out to talk to Wagner. He hasn't yet this year. And Literally the, the last probably month or so is when we've seen Willie come out here to talk to his pitchers. Never did it before in the beginning part of the season. I think he just there's something he wants to say and he doesn't want it to get lost in translation from him to Peterson to the pitcher. So a chance for Brandon Harper a guy who spent 10 years in the minor leagues. Recently got his first big league hit. He's had two at bats. And now he's going to face Billy Wagner. With the tying runs on base, two out. Bernie Castro running for Escobar over at first base, carrying that tying run. So here we go. Harper, who loves it in Toledo, takes the slider in at his feet. <laughs> There go the runners, and it's hit foul. Could it be playable? Delgado over. Makes the catch, and the ball game is over. Carlos Delgado not doing much with the bat these days, but he made two outstanding plays today in the field. Michael Tucker's home run is the difference, and the Mets win it 3-1. to one. Not the ending you expect, but Delgado with a beautiful sliding play to help Wagner finish off his save. Unconventional managing by Frank Robinson. He had the runners going. Fastball off the bat of Harper. Jammed him a little bit. And great job by Delgado getting a great jump and the slide and the catch. A terrific play by Delgado. A great finish for the Mets. As they win it here in Washington and take the rubber game of the series to move to 26 games over 500 for the first time this season. Final score Mets three and the Nationals one. Be sure to join us on the WB 11 for our next Mets telecast next Sunday at 1 p.m. when the Mets play the Colorado Rockies. Now stay tuned for the Fresh Prince of Bel Air already in progress. Mets win it three to one here in the nation's capital. Their 71st win of the year. Great pitchers duel here today. Mr. Met was on hand. Steve Traxel and Tony Armas matched zeros until Alfonso Soriano broke it up with a home run. Mets were able to take advantage of a miscue in the field to tie it. Great play by Valentin and Delgado to get Chad Bradford through a problem and then Michael Tucker with his first home run as a Met that put the Mets in front to stay as they win it three to one. Now for Ron Darling and Chris Connor I'm Gary Cohen saying so long from Washington.